Hello YouTube, this is Douglas, and welcome back to another Voxel Engine devlog. When we left off last episode, I had finished implementing a basic renderer for my engine. I was drawing voxels using ray marching, and the voxels had pretty textures, sunlight shadows, and to top it all off, these neat looking god rays. However, there was one big thing missing, global illumination. The shadows in the crevices of these rocks over here were the same brightness as the shadows beneath the trees, when in reality, they should have looked something more like this. Global illumination accounts for indirect, in addition to direct, sources of light. It simulates how light bounces off one, two, maybe three surfaces before reaching your eye. It creates a more realistic looking scene, and ensures that shadowed areas don't appear flat. I approximated this sort of lighting in previous versions of my engine using path tracing, but for this implementation I wanted to take a less noisy, more efficient approach. And so I implemented an algorithm called Dynamic Diffuse Global Illumination, or DDGI for short. How does it work? The details are fiddly, but at a high level we cover the world in a whole bunch of probes. These probes are points in space that we put near surfaces which need to be lit, and the probes store the incoming light in every single direction for rays passing through their center. Then, when we have a point on a surface that we need to shade, we sample the probes that are nearby, then use a whole bunch of blending to make the light vary smoothly between the probes, since they're at discrete locations in space. On its own, this approach has the downside that light can leak through walls. Consider a scenario like the following. A point on the right hand side of the wall, here, might try to use the lighting value from the probe on the left, even though these two regions are completely disjoint. To solve this, DDGI stores a depth map for each probe in addition to lighting data. The depth map tells our algorithm how close the nearest surface is in any given direction, and this allows us to exclude occluded probes during sampling. So here, the distance from the probe to the wall is shorter than the distance from the probe to the point that we care about lighting, and so we wouldn't consider this probe. As time goes on and our game scene changes, we update our probes by casting random rays and averaging the light coming from each of them. To compute the light at the end of a ray, we use the output from the previous iteration of DDGI, meaning that DDGI is able to simulate an infinite number of light bounces. How cool is that? Now, for this process to be fast and efficient, you want to cast as few rays from as few probes per frame as possible. You also want to make sure that there's some distance between each of your probes and the nearest surface. This ensures that the resolution of the depth and lighting data stored for each probe is fully utilized. You don't want probes right up against walls like this, because then half of the probe's memory and half of the probe samples are being wasted on just this tiny fraction of the surface. This is the challenging part of DDGI, and what I spent most of my time on when implementing it. There's a landslide of bookkeeping associated with spawning probes and keeping track of their memory. So, here are the gory details. DDGI in my engine has sort of two parts. There's a per model baking step that happens once whenever new voxel data is uploaded to the GPU. Then. There's a series of shaders that run every frame. These shaders are responsible for identifying which probe should be active, casting new rays to figure out the light coming from different directions, and then ultimately updating the lighting and depth data of the probes so that it may be used later on when shading the current frame. Starting off with the baking step that happens once per model upload, this is when the engine decides where to place the probes. To recap, we want to place probes close enough to surfaces that they will be used when shading those surfaces, but far enough away that they can cast rays in many different directions. To make it easy to index probes and find them later on, 
I split every model up into a grid, and the base level of this grid has cells which are 16 by 16 by 16 voxels. Each probe lives inside a cell, and each cell contains exactly one probe. But the probe can have an offset within the cell, and that's the goal of the baking step to determine is whether a probe can be placed in a cell, and if so, where. Like usual, I take advantage of the country data structure that I'm using to store my voxels, and so what the algorithm does is it starts at the tree level of a single cell, and then it traverses downward until it finds a totally empty leaf in the country. And it does this in a breath-first manner, so that one of the largest subnodes is selected. And then it just places the probe at the center of that subnode. So for a totally empty cell, the probe would end up right in the center. For a cell that was partially full of voxels, the probe would end up sort of pushed toward one of the edges, like this. And for a cell that was totally full of voxels, no probe would be generated. Lastly, I do the traversal in a certain order that prioritizes subnodes near the center of the cell. Taken together, these heuristics ensure that the probes end up spaced as far apart as possible, with some distance between themselves and the nearest surface. I then downsample the generated data to pick out probe positions for higher levels of detail, or LODs, and so I end up with four LODs, which are increasingly less detailed in resolution, but cover more of the world. This data is all put together and uploaded in buffers to the GPU. And that brings us to the frame-by-frame -frame rendering process. The first step in rendering is figuring out which probes are active. Just because we picked out positions for probes in the previous step doesn't mean we actually have to cast rays for all of them this frame. This is a compute shader that executes once per cell in the grid. It begins by loading some information about the current cell, and also loading information about adjacent cells into shared memory. It checks to see if there was a probe that was spawned within the current cell. If there is, it checks to see if the probe is near a surface. Specifically, this means checking whether there are any voxels in the current cell, or the six adjacent cells, so um, left, right, down, up, back, front. It also checks to see if the current cell overlaps with any non-grid aligned objects bounding box. If none of that is true, then it means there's no surface nearby that could possibly be affected by the probe, and so it doesn't need to cast any rays because its lighting data won't be used. This reduces the number of probes casting rays each frame, which improves performance. If a probe does survive all of that calling, then it's added using GPU Atomics to a work list. That takes us to the next step, which is to actually cast the global illumination rays. I cast roughly the same number of rays per frame, dividing them amongst all of the active probes, which guarantees that performance stays steady no matter how many probes are on screen. The probes cast random rays according to a Fibonacci sphere, and whenever they hit a voxel, they use the previous output of DDGI in order to determine the lit color of that voxel. Or if they hit the skybox, they just take the color of the skybox. And that data is saved into a buffer as a DDGI ray sample. All that's left is to take those ray samples and convert them into lighting data we can actually use. I've been intentionally vague about what it means to store a quantity of light within a probe, but technically DDGI uses irradiance probes. I've talked about this a little bit in a previous devlog, but most calculations in computer graphics can be represented using something called the rendering equation. It's really not as scary as it looks. What it says is that the amount of light you see coming from a surface in a given direction is the weighted average over all possible directions of the light hitting that point on that surface times some material dependent factor, so that wood reflects light differently than a mirror, for example. If we assume that our surface is diffuse, that means it reflects light equally in all directions, then we can pull the material dependent factor out front and we're just left with this term that depends only on the incoming light from various directions. This L inside the integral 
is exactly equal to the lighting values that we recorded earlier as our ray samples. So we can approximate this integral by just taking the weighted average of all of our ray samples multiplied by a constant. This integral, the irradiance, is what the probes actually store. We compute the weighted sum for a whole bunch of different directions, so that no matter what direction a surface faces, we can always grab lighting data for it. The irradiance values for different directions are encoded using an octahedral mapping, which is a way of mapping points on a sphere to points on a 2D square, and all of the irradiance values for every probe are stored in a giant array of 2D textures. This is what the irradiance data looks like at runtime. I do something similar for the depth. I take the average depth of each texel in the octahedral mapping, and I store the depth as well so that it can be sampled later on. The process of sampling the data looks something like this. If we have a voxel that we need to shade, we determine the eight cells nearest to that voxel. For each cell, we compute a standard trilinear weight based upon the displacement from that cell's center to the voxel being shaded. That trilinear weight is used to blend between the eight irradiances of the probes. We then fetch the probe's offsets within their cells, and we compute additional blending factors based upon which probes have line of sight visibility to the voxel, and which probes are in front of the voxel versus which probes are behind the voxel. These weights are multiplied together, and we take a weighted average of irradiance over all eight probes to get a final lit color for the voxel. Like I said, there are a lot of finicky details, but most of the math here is covered in the original paper describing DDGI. And in fact, I actually used three different papers to inform my implementation, so I'll be linking all of them in the description below. They're pretty interesting and range from the theory behind how this works to practical tricks to make DDGI look better in production. And that's the entire algorithm. Listening to the earlier part of this recording, I think that DDGI must be one of the most complicated things I've implemented, and certainly the most complicated thing to explain. Nonetheless, the results are absolutely stunning. The engine now supports dark caves and bright exteriors with a wide range of materials, including dielectrics and metals that are either matte, shiny, reflective, or even emissive. And that's not all. Over the past few months, I've made a whole bunch of other changes to my engine. This includes re-adding the chunk system, world editing, and model imports, as well as implementing a new Vulkan-based renderer with more performance improvements. So, if you want to see where I take the engine next, please leave a like and subscribe. It would mean the world to me. If you have any questions or feedback, please drop a comment below. Thanks very much for watching, and have a lovely day.